Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Take 15 podcast. I'm Lauren, and today on the show, we're tackling an urgent topic, one that everyone, not just investors, should be thinking about, and that is the massive loss of biodiversity across our planet. And I don't use the word urgent lightly. The United Nations calls biodiversity loss a systemic risk and warns that the COVID-19 pandemic had its origins in the illegal trade of wildlife and the destruction of wild habitats, which brought animal disease into contact with humans. And a recent paper from UNPRI says the likelihood of this occurring will only increase as the loss of biodiversity continues, reflecting the significance and urgent need for action by investors. I am so excited about our guest today to help us better understand this topic. His name is Joel Clement, and he is a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Before joining the Harvard Belfer Center, Joel spent seven years at the U.S. Department of the Interior. And let's just say that's when things got interesting. In July 2017, he became the first public whistleblower of the Trump administration, accusing Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke of stifling science, ignoring climate change, wasting taxpayer dollars, and risking the health and safety of Americans in the Arctic. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time, actually about a year, ever since I first heard Joel talking to my son's fifth grade science class via Zoom. Now, both climate change and ethical decision-making are top of mind at CFA Institute. And in the show notes, you'll find a link to our most recent report, Climate Change Analysis in the Investment Process, and also a link to the Ethics Learning Lab. And now, without further ado, here's Joel Clement. Well, welcome, Joel. I'm really excited to have you on the show today. It's a pleasure to be here, Lauren. Thanks for inviting me. So we have like so much to talk about, everything from some climate action, the Arctic, biodiversity, whistleblowing. I don't kind of know what order we'll go in because there's so much to cover. Um, but I thought one sort of fun place to start would actually be where you are right now. You're in Maine, and uh, some of our listeners may have been to Maine, some may never have been to Maine. It's regarded really as one of the most beautiful states in the US. Um, I think I read that it's one of the few that still has a pristine night sky. I'm not sure if that's still true. So I'm curious when someone asks you what life is like in Maine, how do you describe it? <laughs> I, well, so I, I'm, I'm born and raised here in Maine, and I'm actually a 10th generation Mainer, so it's in my blood. But, but I, uh, you mentioned the dark skies, you mentioned the nature, all of this is true. It's actually the most forested state in the country. Uh, and the most rural state uh, east of the Missouri River. So it's uh, unusual for an eastern state uh, to have those qualities. But it also, of course, um, that nature is part of the culture here. There are two mains. There's the coastal main and there's the inland main. And right now I'm sitting in the inland main. It's a very different, you know, lakes and forests. Uh, and it, and the culture in Maine, the, the economy is all driven by those things. On the coast, it's about fishing and lobster and so on sailing. But uh, where I am now, it's about those other things. And it's a big part of the main economy, a uh, big part of the main way of life up here. We call it the way life should be. <laughs> I, I think you have the right idea for how life should be. I was doing some sort of, sort of random research ahead of our conversation because I love fun facts. And I found these two rather fun facts about uh, Maine that it harvests the most lobster in the US. I, I guess I might have known that, but now I know. Um, but also more blueberries are grown in Maine than in any other state. I, that I didn't know. So those are, I guess, positive fun facts. But on the other side, I read some, I guess I would call alarming facts about Maine. Um, and I'm just going to read a, a couple of notes here that there are many species at risk of extinction in Maine. So that theirs include the wild Atlantic salmon, the Canada lynx, the piping plover bird, and one statistic that I read that to me was really shocking, and I believe it came from a study in science, was that 2.9 billion, and that's with a B, which is kind of mind-boggling, so approaching 3 billion birds have disappeared from um, North America since 1970. That's sort of one in four, and I find that kind of pretty horrifying. 
So I thought that might be a good way for us to start our conversation on biodiversity. I know that you recently gave um, a talk and you said there's another crisis that gets a bit lost in all the talk of climate action and that's biodiversity crisis. So I'd love for us to talk a bit about that. And we'll have to start with, uh, I guess, the basics. Uh, what is biodiversity? Yeah, that, and thanks, Lauren, for mentioning the bird crisis because that's not a bad place to start. You know, I, I, I each spring, and it's, it's still migratory bird season now, and so I keep close track of the birds coming through. And even I, in the short time I've been on this property, have noticed those changes. It's, it's shocking. Um, but biodiversity, that's the abundance of life around us. These, it's the diversity of species uh, that, that comprise the ecosystems that we depend on. So everything from birds and, and fish, carnivores and so on, but also insects, worms, what we see in our soils. Um, uh, the coral reefs, of course, are, are teeming. Uh, with diversity, and it's not just the num it's not the number of animals out there that we care about. It's that diversity of types of animals that can occupy different e ecological niches and can play a different role uh, in our in the system that what I call our operating system. Right, those ecosystems drive everything for us from where we get our the clean air, clean clean water, our food, uh, protection from natural hazards, and each of these species plays a different role in that. You need to have redundancies. If one species winks out, there need to be others that can step in. So diversity within ecosystems is a lot like diversity in an investment portfolio, right? You, you, you want redundancy. You want to cover all the bases. Uh, you, you want a richness uh, to those investments, and that's exactly the way we look at biodiversity. And historically, uh, that abundant and, and diverse uh, species complement has really buffered us from disasters, from, from changes in, in temperature and, and weather changes, uh, and from ecological disasters that affect our food supply. Um, you know, Native Americans uh, did an excellent job of growing a diverse set of crops, uh, but they were pollinated by different types of animals. So all of these things, as you could imagine, are very interwoven. Uh, and that's why diversity is important to us. So what's going on? Because when I looked up biodiversity, I, I now see it almost always coupled with biodiversity and crisis. So tell us what is happening and why it is that it seems the world is a little bit slow to wake up to this as a crisis. You know, I think for, for scientists and ecologists, and I'm a trained ecologist, the, the biodiversity crisis we've known to be upon us for quite some time. but it, it doesn't always penetrate. It's a lot like climate change. You can talk about it uh, all you want, but there needs to be a meaningful way to describe how this affects people. Uh, so you'll see an impact on agriculture uh, and that might convince farmers that they need to diversify crops or try different approaches. Um, you know, there are these very locally based solutions. Um, but the crisis itself has been going on for a long time. Um, it's hard to gain the ear of, of the public on these kinds of things because they see the animals still out there. But like you mentioned with the birds, people are starting to see those changes. And the problem is once you start to see those changes, uh, it's ver a very well advanced crisis. That's the same as true of climate change and the uh, um, public health crisis, for example, we see now with the pandemic. I just want to remind listeners, I, I read a good line recently as I was doing some research. Um, and someone has said it's not ESG, which is your environment, social, and governance. It's CSG. So it's not just climate. Um, it's it's not climate, social, and governance. It's environment, you know, social, and governance. And I think the focus has been on the um, the climate side of things, and not so much on the kind of environmental side of of things. So why though do you think um, not just investors, but the wider population has to take action on biodiversity? Well, you know, this is something that comes up a lot when I when I talk about investors or uh, even in academia and government, right? That uh, biodiversity and the environment, our operating system, as I describe it, uh, that we depend upon, uh, propping that up is not just a corporate social responsibility issue, right? It's a business issue. It's a lifestyle issue, the way of life issue, and it's an econ a purely economic issue to some. And I think that's a better way in some ways to communicate this crisis. Some people 
aren't bothered that they don't hear or see as many birds or that they can't get to a park uh, or see the outdoors. I think most people want that, but they don't see it as crucial to life. But when you start to see disasters uh, like these climate, these, these climate induced uh, extreme weather events, uh, when you start to see uh, species winking out far too quickly in certain areas um, and ecosystems crashing as a result, a fishery collapsing, for example, uh, because of overfishing or a lack of kelp or some other some of these other things that have caused these cascading collapses, you start to see that this is actually uh, this is a business issue uh, for for our economy. Um, we need to get beyond, I think, thinking of the biodiversity crisis uh, as as a philanthropic thing to address. Um, it's absolutely essential that we address it. Over a hundred billion dollars worth of climate change damages in 2020 alone. That was double what it was the previous year. Uh, the, these, are, these are not dollars that are just coming out of the federal treasury. That would be bad too. These are coming out of American businesses and, and, and uh, you know, that's just our country. Um, so you can imagine that, that that problem is quite widespread. So I think that's why we need to care about it. It's not just, uh, it's not just to have nature around. Some of us love more than others. It's because Biodiversity is the underpinning of our, of our economy, uh, both here and abroad. So you've been a long time climate activist and I, I mentioned you're joining us from Maine, but a few years ago you were living in Washington, working at the Department of Interior. And I would love to spend a bit of time just talking about that. Um, as listeners will have heard in the setup, you're a whistleblower and uh, CFS Institute cares a lot about ethical training and ethical decision making. So take us back uh, to, was it 2017 when you wrote the op-ed? Uh, for some people, 2017 may seem like a decade ago. And after it last year, me. it does feel like <laughs> such a long time ago. So tell us what was going on in 2017 and what went into your decision to weigh up on whether or not to blow the whistle because whistleblowing comes at a cost, right? A, a personal cost, sometimes a professional cost. What were you weighing up when you made that decision? Yeah, that, thank you for asking that because it's, a, it, it's certainly a difficult process and I've seen others go through it. Um, but I came into government uh, many years before that uh, to focus on climate change and to focus on uh, public lands and ecosystems and all the things we've been talking about because public service means a lot to me. It was finally an opportunity for me to do my part uh, within government rather than coming up with all these ideas, throwing ideas over the castle walls is fine. But when you're on the inside, you can really implement that. And it, and it was really exceeding my expectations, uh, the way I was able to influence policy or you know, um, uh, the, the machinations of, of uh, even over at the White House. So I came into 2017 still feeling very enthusiastic about public service, uh, but of course the Trump administration started on January 20th, and that uh, that changed uh, a number of things. As a lot of people know, um, that uh, Donald Trump was certainly no uh, friend for of uh, climate action folks, and so I anticipated, like many others, that there'd be actions taken to uh, reduce our our um, our ability to address climate change. I assumed they would focus on emissions and carbon and so on, but I, and I worked on climate adaptation and resilience. I didn't think they, why would they interfere with our ability to protect people and ecosystems? But, uh, but as soon as they were legally able to, they reassigned a whole uh, dozens of senior executives uh, at the interior department where I worked. And it appeared very retaliatory. 30% uh, of the reassigned people were uh, American Indian. Uh, for example, and many of us worked on climate change. So they did a purge. Uh, they weren't particularly careful about it, which sort of characterized the administration. Um, and in my view, and, I, and it was clear to me that it was an intentional uh, retaliation for my work because they moved me from uh, climate policy work to uh, the office that collects royalty checks from the oil and gas companies, right? So it wasn't as though they were trying to maximize my assets and my experience. Uh, so I filed a complaint with the Office of Special Counsel saying, hey, you know, I'm working here to protect Americans at risk. Uh, and to reassign me is not only just, you know, getting at me, but you're also affecting the health and safety of Americans. Uh, it's also bad government. Um, and the decision process, Lauren, leading up to that was, uh, 
it, it for me, it was very clear I needed to do something in this case because they were violating the mission of the agency that I had come to serve. Uh, they were re reducing the ability of the agency to respond to problems that it was responsible for. So for some people, you know, others may have had families, mortgage, and so on that, that made them feel compelled to stay and work from the inside to change that. Um, but I felt that I needed, above all, to keep my voice. So number one, I had to call out the bad behavior. And I think that's something we all have to decide where our red line is, right? Um, I had to call out that bad behavior, and I had to maintain my voice. And in order to do that, I, I published this uh, op-ed in the Washington Post saying, hey, I'm blowing the whistle. A lot of people do this confidentially, but uh, I think people need to know. We need to shine a light on this kind of thing. So, you, you know, in terms of ethics, we've seen since then, that was July of 2017. In the, in the subsequent years, of course, the administration became known for ethical lapses and, and a lack of integrity. And that was uh, new to a lot of the people I worked with in government, like career ranks and you know, the career staff, not the political staff. Uh, and so they all had to wrestle with this question over and over. So I should just let listeners know that we will put a link to that um, Washington Post op-ed in the show notes. So if anyone wants to actually go and read what you wrote, um, they'll have access to it. And we'll also include a link to our Ethics Learning Lab if anyone's curious about sort of ethical decision making. But I would love to Also, talk I have a letter. There's a letter in the Washington Post. My resignation letter might be helpful in okay. terms of the... Right. We'll look for that and, and link that as well. I'm curious also just about um, what the response was like when you blew the whistle. Um, were you surprised by the responses? That it was it different than what you'd expected? Yeah, it was, Lauren, because I, you know, I thought I was just going to do my bit and kind of disappear into the sunset. I just couldn't uh, leave without saying something. Um, in the back of my mind, I hoped maybe others would blow the whistle uh, down the road. Um, but the result, the, the, the immediate outcome really surprised me. I didn't expect all the media attention. I didn't expect, I, I was getting, I had a, when I finally did go back to the office after taking a few days off, there was a stack of postcards and letters on my desk, on this new desk, um, from people around the country saying, thank you for doing that. And it, it stunned me. Uh, and I think it was because people were seeing the behavior of this new administration. They were hoping some people would say, hey, hang on a second, there's a line there. You shouldn't be doing that. And I heard from a lot of uh, the career ranks, the colleagues at the agency and other agencies saying, thank you for being our voice. And I think that's an important role. And some people need to do that. Other people need to hunker down and try and slow down bad decision making, things like that. But uh, frankly, you know, the career ranks are there, serve the mission of the agencies. Uh, they're great at that, and they've continued doing that even during the bad times. And now, of course, things are a little. There's, a, there's an ethical administration in place, but but the net effect uh, was not what I overall. I, I was surprised by the media attention, but I I expected more people to come forward. Right. It's interesting you use the word voice. Actually, one of our courses is ca called "Giving Voice to Values," and it's really important that people find that voice. Um, I was going to ask you whether it was a lonely experience. Um, and it sounds like in, initially there was a lot of interest, so there were a lot of people, but was it, still, was it a lonely experience? Yeah, it was very lonely. I, 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 rem I will never forget the moment I, I took a few days off after blowing the whistle, and then I came back to work. And that day I got to the front door of the interior department, the headquarters building, and I paused. I actually texted my attorney and said, do I have to do this? Because you, I'm going into a building where I, I've just kind of blown things up a little bit and there was a bit, a lot of media coverage. Um, what's that gonna be like? And it is a lonely feeling to walk through those halls, but you're always you know, in the cafeteria or elsewhere. You're, you're, I certainly had a lot of people giving me the thumbs up quietly. Uh, they knew their jobs were at stake. They couldn't be seen as, you know, Joel's best allies in the building. Um, and I understood that. So I didn't compel anyone to sit with me at lunch, although a lot of people did. And, uh, but it, but it, you know, there was that. It was, it was kind of a quiet uh, alliance, but it's still, of course, it feels very lonely. You, 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 you're, you know, you've voluntarily put yourself apart, um, but that's part of the process, I think, of keeping that voice sometimes. 
So I wanted to read you something. Uh, there was a, a panel back in, I think it was 2018 at one of our conferences. It was called The Price and the Prize of Whistleblowing. And Stephanie Gibor, who was a whistleblower at UBS, this is what she said. She said, this word whistleblower is so negative. It's really radioactive when someone says he or she is a whistleblower. Do you feel it's a negative word? Uh, I don't. I, I think it's it's just, you know, this is part of the process uh, of maintaining ethics and integrity in, in any en enterprise, be it business or government. Um, I think the reason it's taken on a taint is oftentimes when they're publicized, uh, it's it may be a national security uh, whistleblower, you know, like Edward Snowden or somebody, you know, that that gives it a certain uh, tinge of controversy. But frankly, uh, Congress addressed this issue by creating the Whistleblower Protection Act, the whistleblower, uh, the, the enhancement of the Whistleblower Protection Act. So twice they've passed laws to protect people that do this. It's seen as great value. The National Whistleblower uh, Center uh, has all kinds of resources for people who are um, considering doing that. And, you know, uh, I think those high profile cases have perhaps put a patina over it, but I'm very proud of being a whistleblower. I've had a lot of whistleblowers reach out to me saying, hey, you know, almost sort of welcome to the, the team. Um, we know what you went through. It's not easy, but it's really important. And I think you'll always be proud that you did that. And, and I would say the same to a new whistleblower. So what advice do you give whistleblowers who are coming to you as they're weighing up this, you know, do I, don't I, the kind of personal cost, the professional cost, the, the, the moral, the ethics of what they're doing? Yeah, I, I always say, imagine yourself 15 or 10 or 15 years from now, looking back on this. Would you be more proud to have just kept your head down and gone along with it or have spoken up? Uh, how would you evaluate yourself uh, looking back? And, and I, cause I find that gives me a lot of clarity. I'm very proud of what I did despite the struggles. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes easier to, to imagine yourself looking back. How would you feel about that individual? And I, I, so I encourage people to do that. I, people need to look out for their income. They need to make sure they can pay the bills. That's really important, but there are ways to speak out, uh, without compromising that. The, unfortunately, the whistleblowers are not protected enough. So Congress does need to really firm up the whistleblower protections. Um, there are lots of ways they can do that. I've been working with the Union of Concerned Scientists to help propose ways that they can do that. So hopefully that'll come along. Let's hope so. So I guess fast forward. Uh, so you resigned uh, in Washington. You, you moved back to Maine. What have you been working on uh, in the last few years? Well, in addition to the work with Union Concerned Scientists on, on kind of publicizing how the Trump administration, administration was politicizing science, which was a problem, uh, I work full-time uh, now at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. And at the Belfer Center, I, work, I continued my work on the Arctic region because it's a, a region in transformation, rapid transformation. The Arctic is warming uh, three times as fast as the rest of the planet. And there are about 4 million people that live up there. It has implications for the rest of the planet. It's, it's in a really important place to study in the context of climate change, both in terms of emissions and resilience. The role of the sea ice and the role of those ice caps uh, in, in maintaining our global climate are essential. So I've been continuing that work up there, working with students, teaching and, and uh, writing quite a lot about these issues. So take us a little bit deeper in that you said, uh, you know, the, what's happening in the Arctic has implications for the world at large. Um, just help us understand uh, how that is and why it's so critical that we pay attention to what's happening in the Arctic. Well, on one hand, uh, it, it's transforming so quickly that, you know, losing the sea ice uh, has a lot of dramatic implications in terms of the planet's reflectivity. So we're absorbing more heat because of that loss of ice. So there's a, a, a feedback loop there. But obviously, if we lose the Greenland ice cap, we lose Miami, right? We lose most of the low-lying Pacific atolls. We lose, you know, we're, we're losing a lot of uh, our most uh, populated centers on Earth. Uh, also, as we lose that sea ice up there, it's changing geopolitics in the North because you know, we've seen in this last year when that 
the uh, the ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, uh, looking for alternatives. And Russia knows very well that one of the best alternatives in the in the coming years is going to be that Northern Sea Route that goes along the coast of Russia as they lose that sea ice. So there are geopolitical implications, there are economic implications, and of course the survivability of the coasts around the world depends on what's happening up in up in that region up there. Um, setting aside even, uh, of course, the 4 million people live, that live up there, 10% uh, of them are indigenous. Who They've been doing this for many thousands of years, uh, but they are also now what I would call climate frontline communities. Uh, they're being affected by coastal erosion, the thawing permafrost, bigger storms, lack of sea ice, uh, very, very uh, vulnerable to change now up there. Hmm. So in the last few weeks, there have been quite a few headlines uh, about Biden, uh, action on the climate. Is America back in the, uh, the climate game? It's making some big promises. What do you think? I, I do think so. Lauren, I'm, I'm actually very optimistic, and, I, and I'm, I'm really happy to be able to say that. I think the, this new administration, uh, President Biden, has exceeded all of our expectations in terms of what's being said. Now, I also know Congress can be a problem. Uh, going forward. So getting things done is still going to hurt or be difficult. But boy, they're, they're doing a fantastic job. I wrote an article recently about it. You know, Biden hosted that climate leadership summit just a couple weeks ago. Uh, and a lot of people were asking that same question. Has America's credibility globally plummeted too far? Can you really remedy it when you have such a debacle as the Trump administration was in terms of international action on climate and biodiversity? And uh, it seemed very apparent to me that, of course, you can, that the U.S. came roaring back on this, that it's the largest economy in the world. So no one's going to turn their back on those opportunities to get this right. So, yeah, I think we're back. Uh, I, I, I hope we're back in a constructive way. And, of course, I hope we can maintain it. Mm. I guess one of the things I heard you say before is you're a self-described climate hawk. But you also say that recently you, you experienced a renewal of faith. So it sounds like you're... You're still feeling uh, optimistic about what you've heard and seen recently. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the the America the Beautiful report that just came out. Uh, are you familiar with that? Yes, I am. That's from my old agency. Put that together. Can you tell us a bit more about what's in it and whether we should be excited about that? Yeah, this is very directly related to the biodiversity crisis that you opened with, and and. Uh, Science for quite a long time now has been trying to arrive at how much do we need to protect to maintain these ecosystems in order to maintain these economies and so on. And they determined that 30%, uh, both lands and waters, uh, including oceans, should be protected in some way. Uh, and there are some criteria for that. When the Biden administration came in, an executive order early on said, okay, Interior Department and Commerce and Council on Environmental Equality and, and, and Department of Agriculture, please put together a report. How are we going to go about this if this is a goal for this administration? And so this report says, basically, you know, this is going to be hard, but we think we can do it. Here are the criteria we need to use. Here's why. And here's how inclusive this is meant to be. It's not just about saving critters or locking up land. It's about preserving economies. It's about increasing access to nature for uh, disadvantaged communities. So it's an environmental justice report as much as it is uh, an environmental protection and economic protection report, right? So it's a way to kind of deliver the goods on ecosystem and biodiversity protection while preserving, while enhancing uh, economic opportunity and enhancing our, our access uh, to these natural places. So it's a real turning point, I think, for how we manage our public lands uh, in, in the United States. It's a real opportunity to see this is not just jobs versus the environment, which is always how it used, that's how the industry used to, to frame it. It's about uh, the, the jobs that come from the environment and it's about the importance of leveling out opportunity uh, across uh, different economic strata so we can all, we can all uh, thrive. So I think it's a great re report, but it's only of course just the beginning. Uh, but they did a nice job with it. Yeah, well, we'll be sure to, to link in that as well in the show notes. Um, before we go to the sort of closing questions, I just want to go back to something I had mentioned right from the beginning, you know, ESG versus you know, CSG. It's not just climate, it's, it's environment. And many of our listeners uh, um, are thinking about ESG factors as they're investing, but not everyone is as convinced uh, that they should be thinking about it. And I'm just wondering, I'm sure you come across um, many skeptics in your work 
Um, but when you do, is there one thing or a few things you tell people to help them really understand that this is personal, it's not just sort of out there in the world that really affects them in their lives, these decisions? Yeah, and I, honestly, I think that's the only way to communicate uh, these kinds of problems, particularly the climate crisis. You have to to, to know well, what are their values, right? I mean, I, I, I think in, in the business community, for example, uh, you know, I talk about how costly uh, climate change is and has been each year and how costly it will be going forward, right? I mean, carbon emissions are going to be more costly. There'll be prices on them, for example. So if I'm speaking with a business group or if I'm speaking with even people who work within the fossil fuel industry, I say, you know, this is about reducing risk and trying to gain competitive advantage in a new world where carbon is costly and where these where these impacts are very costly. Um, so, you know, in that context, and that's generally the only re area these days where I run into people who are resistant. Um, it's about the economy, um, you know, and it's about jobs. And and the Biden administration is doing the same thing. They're like, look, this this is a huge opportunity for us to capitalize on a transition to a new way of powering our economy. Uh, and that's important. We can let other, company, uh, other countries do it, or we can do it ourselves. If we don't, if we delay, it's gonna be a heck of a lot more expensive uh, for all of us in the economy. We'll, we'll show those, those impacts. So that's generally how I talk about it uh, with, with folks, even from the fossil fuel industry. And just, I guess, you personally, you looking out and you watching the migratory birds, you can see the effects uh, of climate change and biodiversity crisis, I guess, from your window, right? Yeah, I mean, in the, on a personal note, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people, and, and this is why I think access to nature is so important. I think people have lost track of how connected we are to the natural world around us and the joy that you can get by being surrounded by that. I'm so fortunate here. I'm very privileged uh, to be, you know, looking out at this lake and seeing loons and, and, and watching songbirds come through. Uh, it allows me to maintain that connection that I feel, you know, it was hard to do in the cities. And, and so um, I encourage people to, to get outside. Sometimes I think that's the most important thing can be done. You know, get out there and remember the place we have on this earth, that we are not here. Uh, simply to make money, uh, buy a big TV, and eventually die. We're here to connect, not just with one another, but with the natural world uh, that sustains us. Uh, so on a personal note, that's where I come from. That's a good segue into uh, the closing question. So I started this about a year ago when Trevor Noah, who is, he's also South African, but he, he has the, you know, the Daily Show. And at the end of his segment, he was including what he called the ray of sunshine question, because I think it was just so much doom and gloom that was going on. It kind of was nice to end on something positive. So my first question really is just what one, what is one sort of positive, long lasting change that you hope to see um, as a result of the pandemic? Uh, as a result of the pandemic, my goodness. You know, I think, you know, first let me say that the pandemic is directly related to the biodiversity crisis, right? I think, you know, sometimes it's worth saying that if we were not constraining the environment and building out into it as much, we wouldn't be interacting with these kinds of pathogens. Uh, so there's a direct connection. And as a result of this pandemic, I hope uh, people realize that this is not how we want to maintain our place on this planet. Um, if we can dial back those encroachments on ecosystems, uh, we'll, we'll be a healthier uh, population of humans. And I've, so I've seen some really fantastic uh, reporting on that. I've seen some really good studies coming out that, you know, here's how, now that we have an actual case of economic disaster related to the biodiversity crisis, let's get it right next time. Let's be more careful and let's find ways to uh, reduce that. The 30 by 30 initiative is, is, is an example of that. But I think there's a stronger interest in, in, uh, in protecting nature. I think some people saw these news reports of you know, dolphins reappearing in Southeast Asian rivers or water, clear, clear water running through Venice. Um, and they sort of like that. Uh, so I think there might be a, a little bit of an awakening to the possibilities there. So the second question is what I call the NASA question. And it came from, I think it was like a middle school question for you know, kids in science. 
and that is um, you're about to go on a, a long duration space flight and you can take one object or one item with you. What does Joel take? Oh my goodness. It would come from very close by here. Uh, I'm torn. Uh, I have a, uh, a carved, uh, an indigenous colleague carved uh, a, a loon, um, which would be fantastic to bring with me because it would remind me both of the natural places and the indigenous people that stewarded these lands for so long. Uh, maybe I'll go with that. I think that's the way to go because, you know, my connection to nature is absolutely essential to me, but my respect for the indigenous cultures that stewarded nature for all those thousands of years for us is also immense. So I think I would, that's the object I would bring. Okay. And now we're going in a totally different direction. Um, this is a fun one that I added a few months ago because I listened to a great episode, an old episode um, of This American Life that was about superpowers. And so... Mm -hmm. You're going to get to pick a, a superpower, but it can only be one of two things. You can either choose a flight or invisibility. Whichever one you choose, you're the only person in the world who has that one. And which one do you pick and what do you do with it? Okay, so that I can only pick one of these two superpowers? Yeah, either flight. I have another... yeah, yeah, you have another one you'd, you'd rather like? Well, I, 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 there's the, the superpower that I've always wanted to have is to be able to communicate with everyone. Ah. In their language, right. Whether, it, whether it's a, an animal or someone from Kazakhstan, just to right. have that language superpower. But setting that aside, uh, I, I, I think flight obviously would be a, a, a amazing. And maybe I would use it, uh, you know, because let's just assume that's carbon free flight. <laughs> <laughs> let's assume I'm not burning any carbon. To fly. <laughs> Uh, that's an opportunity to get out and spread the word and talk to people about what we need to do. I'm modeling good behavior by not burning carbon, but I'm still able to do the traveling <laughs> uh, and get to these places and communicate with more and more people about the importance of climate action. So I think I would use it as sort of a way to turbocharge uh, yeah. the work that I do uh, in a carbon-free way. Right. <laughs> oh, that's an excellent answer. Well, it's been a delight talking with you, Joel. Thank you so it's much for fun. joining me today. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it. All right. You've been listening to the Take 15 podcast from CFA Institute. If you haven't yet subscribed, you can do so on our YouTube channel or wherever you listen to the show. That way, you never miss an episode. And if you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate a rating and review. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us too. And a quick reminder, this podcast isn't intended to provide expert advice on the topics we covered. If you need tax, accounting, or legal advice, please consult a professional. I'm Lauren Foster. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.